Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a joy to be back with you in the house of prayer one more Sunday to give the Lord the praise and the glory that only the Lord deserves. I must rush to express my gratitude to the rector of this fine church, the Reverend Wes Smedley, and to the entire pastoral team of Reverend Clergy, and to you, God's people, who are joining us from your own virtual sanctuary, whether you are gathering in your family room or your kitchen or even your bedroom or your vehicles, wherever you find yourselves on this Lord's Day, we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Uh, join me, if you would, uh, in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. This is Paul's epistle to the Romans. We heard it read earlier, and I would like to just emphasize two verses in your hearing. I'll begin reading from the first verse of the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us bow our heads for a brief moment of prayer. Father in heaven, we bow our heads before you now, thanksgiving and praise for all that you have done. We thank you now for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our pathway. We pray that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see the truth of your word, open our hearts to be able to receive the truth of your word and touch our hands to be willing to do obediently whatever it is you say. Bless this frail preacher as your word of God goes forward. Bless every soul, every listener to not only be a hearer but to be a doer on today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today I am led to share with you from the subject, Changed. Changed. As we have discovered in the coronavirus pandemic, of all the things that have truly gripped our attention, we find one thing standing above all, and that is the frailty of the human experience. We know that as human beings in this life, we are broken. We are broken people. We are frail. We are one breath away. We are one incident away. We are one phone call away from our lives changing all together. And certainly we see human brokenness on display in terms of racism in our society. As we come to this, the second Sunday that I have the privilege of sharing with you in the series on racism and Christian discipleship, uh, this certainly does grip our attention. We recognize that racism and all other perversions of a Christian worldview are simply the result of human brokenness, sin, if you will, that has caused our human condition to be less than God's best. And just as racism is a result of human brokenness, I would argue also that looting and other forms of violence are a result of human brokenness. The desire to take from someone else is a result of human brokenness. And the question that grips all of us is what should we do about the brokenness all around us? And many of us have been compelled to act in one way or another to try to confront 
the brokenness that is all around us. But we don't confront the brokenness that is in us. We confront the brokenness that is taking place in the world. We see the brokenness on social media, the brokenness on your favorite cable news channel of choice. But we oftentimes jump into action without taking stock of the brokenness within us. And I would argue that one of the greatest threats to the church's vitality in this age is people who want to engage in Christian orthopraxy without the gospel. In other words, people who want to have an outward religiosity without inward change. People who want to go through the motions of Christian practice without the inward reality of having been changed by the Holy Spirit. Because, brothers and sisters, before one can honestly engage in the work of anti-racism, before one can honestly approach the task of loving one's neighbor as oneself, we also must have an intimate and personal encounter with God for ourselves. Because without the encounter that we have with God on the inside, we are not prepared to engage the world on the outside. I'm not talking about whether or not you go to church or whether or not you live stream your Sunday worship faithfully. This is not just a relationship with church. This is a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is not just about your giving of your finances. This is not just about your volunteerism at the favorite ministry or charity of your choice. This is about you. God cares more about you and me than he cares about what we have to offer. Because if we think about it honestly, anything we've got to give, God gave it to us in the first place. Everything I've got, everything I am, God gave it to me. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. And if we are God's people, which we are, then we recognize that God doesn't need us to give God resources that God has created for us to be able to steward. God cares about us. And it is the encounter with God that must be the pretext to any kind of public disciple. The difficulty in this age is that we hear about social justice and the idea of social justice being unhitched from the gospel of Jesus Christ is a terrible, terrible tragedy. You cannot disentangle justice in the social space without dealing with the God who is just. Where does justice come from but the only true and living God? We must recognize that our activism and our advocacy and our intercession and our mediation are acts of God. And if in fact we want to take on the work that God is assigning, we must first accept the fact that we need a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It is that personal encounter with God that helps you move beyond reading the scripture to be able to know the truth of the scripture that says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's an encounter with God for yourself that helps you recognize that you are loved with an everlasting love, that you are accepted in the beloved and that your life is precious in the sight of God. It is having that, all, that experience for yourself, not your grandmother or your grandfather, your mother or your father or even your pastor. It's having your experience with God that gives you the fuel to be able to move from belief to behavior. And this is what Paul is saying to the Romans in this 12th chapter of his epistle as he has laid out an amazing exposition of the gospel of grace. 
He comes to this moment after 11 chapters of masterful theology. Comes now to urge the saints of God to act. Because belief without behavior is just an intellectualism that we call faith. It is faith and works. He says to them, I beseech you, I urge you. He, he uses the Greek word here, parakaleo, which is to call alongside. It's more than just a simple request and it's less than a command. It is, it's a pleading, it's a, a beseeching, it's a, a tender yet urgent pastoral wooing to the people of God. Not out of guilt, not out of compliance, not out of shame, but in full view of the mercies of God. This is what he says. He says, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul says, in full view of the mercies of God, not only because you are remembering God's mercy, and are acting to try to repay God, but recognizing that it's the very mercy of God that enables you to act in the first place. What are some of the mercies of God, you ask? Well, I'm glad you did. Let's talk about some of the mercies of God for a moment. You have been delivered from the power and penalty of sin in Jesus Christ. You have been given the free gift of salvation. You have been justified by faith. You have access to God through Jesus Christ on your own. May I go on? You've woken up this morning. You've been started on your way. You have breath in your lungs. You have the activity of at least some of your limbs. You may not have all the activity you used to have. And arthritis might impede some of that activity. But you've still got evidence of the mercy of God. You've been sustained in a time of loss. You were healed when you were sick. You've been provided for when you lost your job. You've been held in the cradle of God's arms when you were lonely. You've got evidence of the mercy of God. And it's in view of that mercy that Paul says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. Not just the ideological you. Not just the philanthropic check-writing you, but all of you. Not just your doctrinal self. Not just your Sunday morning self. But your practical self. Your whole self. Present all of you to God. Because Christian discipleship is not just about doctrine. It's about deeds. Kenneth Wiest, that great Greek scholar, New Testament professor at the Moody Bible Institute, in his expanded translation of the New Testament, wrote that this text is saying, place yourselves at the disposal of God. A sacrifice, a living one, a holy one, well-pleasing to God. That is your spiritual worship. That is your sacred service. And once we offer ourselves to God, fully and completely, our relationship with the world has to be different. There ought to be a difference between the surrendered servant and the world. There ought to be a difference between the surrendered servant and the casual churchgoer who may have visited the baptismal font, but whose life still belongs to them. You say, well, how do we answer this call from Paul in verse number one? As I hasten to a close, we have the answer in verse two. Here's how we do it. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this age. The Greek word there is suskematizo. Not letting our behavior be shaped by this self-absorbed, me-focused, morally relativistic, convenience-driven age. Not to be conformed to the blue state, red state, Republican, Democrat binary. Not letting yourself be bound by the bridge up or bridge down, north side, south side, or west side labels that have come 
to define us. Not letting ourselves be locked up in socioeconomic status and colorism and ageism and sexism. Not to let those things typify us, but instead to be transformed. Not to transform ourselves, because Christianity is not just about behavior modification. Christianity is about transformation of the heart. And so Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because when God has all of us, God does the work of consuming our hearts and setting our minds on fire with the truth of his love and renewing our minds. It's like a factory reset in your mind to bring your thoughts into alignment with God's thoughts so that your view of the world matches God's view so that you can prove or as another translation says discern what is the will of God, the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. In other words, Paul is saying, I don't want you to just know God's will. I want you to be able to understand and evaluate with the intent of agreeing with God. You might say, well, that sounds great. But what do I do now? Can I change myself and then come to Christ and experience this great work of which you, you preach? No. Paul simply encourages us, wherever we find ourselves, whatever brokenness typifies our current condition, surrender yourself. So lift your hands right where you are. I know that some of you all are Episcopalian, and this might feel uncomfortable, but I promise you, if you lift your hands and just tell God, I surrender, he'll take you and make more of your life than you ever could on your own. He will change you from the inside out and you'll have a testimony that God has done an inside job on me that has outside results. You'll be able to testify with the psalmist what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I've been changed. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you have given us to be changed, to be not just different than we used to be, but to be better than we ever could be on our own. You take us, you mold us, you shape us just as the potter does the clay. And we give you thanks that you're not just looking for our sacrifices, you're looking for us. We don't have to get ourselves together to be acceptable to you. You do the work. And so, God, I pray that as I have done my very best to try to preach your holy word, that your Holy Spirit will do the work of transformation in our hearts first by the renewing of our minds so that we can go out from this place and do the work of redeeming our broken world for you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and King, we pray. Amen.